What are my thoughts on burning sage and collecting crystals? Am I optimistic or am I pessimistic about the future of the country? Would I rather eat Moe's Chipotle or Qdoba? Who is my favorite superhero? What's my encouragement for Christian public school teachers? We are answering all of these questions and many, many more on today's episode of Relatable, which is brought to you by our friends at Good Ranchers. Go to GoodRanchers.com. Use code Allie at checkout. That's GoodRanchers.com. Code Allie. Hey guys, welcome to Relatable. So I'm answering some of the questions that you guys sent me on Instagram today. I always love, I always love taking in your questions. A wide range. We'll be talking about some serious stuff, some not so serious stuff. I'll start with the not so serious question. Well, serious to me because I care so much about Mexican food and what kind of food I consume. So this is a very important question to me, but I understand maybe not consequential to everyone listening to this. Nevertheless, I want to answer it because it's a good one. Okay, a question that I got. Chipotle, Qdoba, or Moe's? All right, Moe's is terrible. So let's just put that out there. Moe's is not good. It shouldn't even be in the same realm of conversation with Qdoba and Chipotle. Now, I will say same thing with, so I used to live in Athens, Georgia, and there was like a um, a Barberitos, I think, and there were some other, I can't remember the names, there were some other competitors there, and people in the Southeast like Moe's. I went to school in Greenville, South Carolina, at a small school there, we had a Moe's on campus, and people thought Moe's was so good. But as someone who was born and raised in Texas, no, no, no welcome to Moe's for me. So, okay, Chipotle and Qdoba. I have been a Qdoba diehard fan my whole life. However, Chipotle is what is accessible to me now, and I do have Chipotle more than I have Qdoba. But if you're looking, like, you got to look at a few different things here. And I think the main thing that you really have to look at if you're looking for what is the best fast Tex-Mex, if you don't know what I'm talking about, if you live in like Minnesota or something and you don't know what Qdoba is, we're talking about fast Tex-Mex type things where you just, you know, you walk in, I guess maybe I'll have Chipotle. But all right, so Qdoba has way better queso. And that I think is a really good indication of what kind of quality you're getting. Whereas Chipotle just added queso And for those of you in the Southeast, we're talking about cheese dip, okay? Talking about cheese dip. It's called queso. Um, I would say that Chipotle still has not mastered the queso. It's still gross. And therefore, like, I probably have to rate Qdoba better than Chipotle, even though I eat Chipotle a lot more than I eat Qdoba, because that's just what I have access to now. Um, so, yeah, that's that's my ranking. I'm sure I offended a whole lot of you. If Mo is out there, I'm sorry for hurting your feelings, but your restaurant just isn't as good as Qdoba or for or Chipotle. And it's Qdoba, by the way. It's not Qdoba, it's Qdoba, all of this. Very, very important. Um, All right, let's look at some more questions, maybe some more serious questions, although you never never really know. Oh, this is a good question. How many times a week do you wash your hair? Two, probably two times a week. Definitely not every day. It's not really great for your hair to wash it every day. My hair color, I guess, is kind of the hair color that you can get away with not washing it every day. Also, life hack, if you are trying to be like a little more natural, you don't want to wash your hair every day, but you don't really like all of the ingredients in um, in dry shampoo, which I mean, moms live and die by dry shampoo. It's how you get through the week without looking like a complete and total trash person, but it's not really that great for you. So you can get arrowroot powder from uh, like Sprouts, Whole Foods, you know, health food stores. And it's, you know, a kind of powder that I think people replace flour with. And yet if you put it in your hair, it disappears. So you don't look like George Washington forever, but it does soak up the grease in your hair. So sometimes that's what I'll use because no one has time. I don't have time to wash my hair that many times a week. And I don't think it's that great for you. Sometimes, I know not everyone can do this, but sometimes I'll get my hair blown out. And that is an amazing gift. And I absolutely love getting my hair blown out, even though I'm very tender headed and it's not a fun process for me. I still love doing it because that stuff lasts 
for a really long time. I mean, if I could do that like all the time, I would. That is also a life hack. If you can go get your hair blown out, make them wash it twice, that'll last you. So yeah, the answer is about twice a week. Okay, Naturally It's Clean. Bob Vila says the Naturally It's Clean has the most eco-friendly carpet stain remover on the market today. That's good to know because I use the carpet cleaner a lot. If you've got kids like me, you know that carpets are just, it's a treacherous area. You never know what's going to spill that day, whether it's you spilling your coffee, whether it's paint, whether it's pets. Who even knows? I love having this carpet cleaner on hand, not only because it's safer for my family, but also because it really works. I'm not just saying that. I can attest to that. This might be my favorite product because of how effective it is. You just spray it on there. You let it sit for a second and then you scrub it off and it really works. Like even on that kind of like um, long carpet that's really difficult to get the stains out from the bottom, it's worked on that. I'm talking like paint. It's worked. So I really encourage you to check out Naturally It's Clean. They've got all kinds of products. They've got multi-service cleaner, which we use all the time. They've got stainless steel cleaner. They've got laundry detergent. They've got those little stain remover wipes. This is also a company that loves America, shares our values, and they've got really good stuff. It's made from plant enzymes, so it's safer for everyone. Go to naturallyitsclean.com. Use promo code Allie, naturallyitsclean.com slash Allie. Naturallyitsclean.com slash Allie for an additional 15% off. Naturallyitsclean.com slash Allie for 15% off. Naturallyitsclean.com slash Allie. Next question, more serious question, change of pace here. It's how we do it on Relatable. How to deal with discontentment as a young person desiring stability. So first of all, I just want to tell you that it is normal human nature. It is an innate drive to want stability and security. And it's very important in our lives. I've kind of talked about, I've, I think I talked about this maybe at the beginning of the new year, how there is part of us who really wants change. Like we require seasons. That's why... COVID was really hard, especially for those of you who lived in those blue states, not seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, not knowing when normalcy was going to come and not knowing when things were really going to change. Like we were constantly put like this carrot was put in front of us, like by Easter, by summer, by Christmas, by next year. And we felt like we were just surviving on the prospect of future normalcy. And so we like really desire that change. We really need some kind of movement forward. Human beings don't exist well in just kind of this static state. That's why when you think about the Chronicles of Narnia, when you think about the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, how awful it was for the creatures in Narnia to be cursed with a perpetual winter without any Christmas. Think about being placed in perpetual darkness, perpetual cold without any hope of season. So God created seasons. He created us to need those seasons, to need those cycles, to need those changes, to need to age, to need different stages of life. But at the same time, we don't do well with chaos. So there is a difference between needing necessary change and a turning of seasons and chaos and um, unpredictability. We like the change, but we need it to be predictable. We need things to hold us down. We need family. We need community. We need a daily routine. We need a home. We need that kind of security and protection. We need to know where our next meal um, is coming from. Human beings have craved these things, have sought these things, have built entire civilizations and societies based on human beings' need for this kind of protection and stability and security. So just understand, if you are discontent because you need stability, I don't know exactly what that means in your life. Understand like that part of that is human nature. You have a natural human longing for that. But, and again, I don't know all of the factors contributing to the instability in your life. Maybe you're talking about you want to get married, you want to have kids, you want a stable job, or maybe you're younger and you just wish your parents created a kind of stable home for you. And all of these things right now may feel like they're out of your control. So really, what can you do to contribute to the stability in your life? Can you join a local church? Can you find a group of friends at that local church or a Bible study that you can plug into? Can you create a daily routine in your life that gives you some kind of regimen and predictability? 
Um, and then, of course, just reminding yourself, which we have to do every day in a variety of ways for a variety of reasons, preaching the gospel to yourself, because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's what Hebrews 13, 8 says. And so while we need these changes in seasons, like we also need a solid rock on which we can place our feet. And that solid rock is Christ. So even when your life or the world is in chaos, even when you can't predict anything, like we can have the same peace that Jesus had when he was sleeping on the ship in the midst of the storm with his disciples, because we trust in that God. We have that power, that spirit of God within us that calms the waves and calms the seas. And so knowing who we are in Christ, knowing that we belong to him, that our purpose is wrapped up in him, that our identity and everything that we are and everything that we need is found in him. Like I encourage you to go read Matthew 10. I encourage you to go read Jesus's words about worry, about anxiety, um, about looking to him for everything that we need. If God clothes the lilies of the field, which are, uh, and the, and the grass, grass of the pasture, all of these things are here today and gone tomorrow. If he cares about the flight and the plight of sparrows, two of which are sold for a penny, then how much more does he care about us, people who are made in the image of God? So I just encourage you to preach those things to yourself in addition to trying to find ways to create stability and predictability in your own life, because again, that is a natural desire. Um, All right, next question. Thoughts on burning sage. So I totally understand why you're asking this. Um, Witchcraft is something that has become very popular, especially among millennials and young people. We did an episode on this a couple years ago, why millennials are engaging in witchcraft, why this has become a thing on TikTok. There's something called witch talk where they talk about, you know, casting spells and all the different things that come with witchcraft. And it's part of the new age. And it's really become very commercial in our capitalistic society. I'm not hating on capitalism. This is just how it is. The supply and demand, things become very commercialized. Even niche things become commercialized. Even demonic things become commercialized. So now you can walk into... Um, you can walk into Barnes and Noble and you see like spell books and you see tarot cards and you see uh, Ouija boards and all of those things, which really should be cast into the outer darkness and really shouldn't be accessible, especially to young people at all. Because while we can laugh at them, demonic forces are real and can use these things, can use these things to um, really darken people's people's minds and to really harm people and to trap people. Um, in this kind, a form of, a form of, we could get into the theology of all of this, but a form of demonic possession in, at least in that someone is following the prince of the power of the air rather than the Holy Spirit as Ephesians 2 distinguishes. So burning sage is kind of a part of this witchcraft culture. However, I also want to remind you that like God made sage, God made sage, God made herbs, and God made crystals. God made all of these things which naturally occur in the world. So they in themselves are not evil. Like sage in itself is not an evil plant. A crystal is not evil. And so I think it depends on what the purpose is. Are you burning sage in your home for some kind of witchy reason or some superstitious reason, even if you wouldn't call it witchcraft, just because you think it's going to like cleanse the aura or cleanse the spirits in the room, or because you think it's going to banish bad vibes or bad energy or evil forces or darkness or whatever, then yes, that is a form of witchcraft, which is absolutely forbidden in scripture. You can't worship two gods at once. That would be idolatry. And again, you're just inviting in things that you just really don't want to mess with. But if you have sage in your house because you think sage is beautiful, because you think it's a beautiful color, because God created it, and you know that everything that God created um, is, you know, can speak to his glory, then I think that's fine. Same thing with crystals. If you have a crystal that you got on vacation because you think it's beautiful and you put it in your home, I think that's fine. If you have it because you think it's going to bring you some kind of luck or because you think it's going to wash over you or ban evil spirits, then, okay, we've got an idolatry, uh, an idolatry problem there. So I think that those are things to consider. It really matters what the purpose is of you using these different items. 
Okay, let me tell y'all about relief band. So if you struggle with nausea for any reason, whether you're going through something like chemotherapy or you get it from motion sickness or you are in those first trimester throes of nausea and morning sickness, you need to check out the only or the number one FDA cleared anti-nausea wristband that has been clinically proven to quickly relieve and effectively prevent nausea and vomiting. And that is relief Band. So this is just a band that you wear on your wrist. It stimulates a nerve that tells your brain to communicate to your stomach to stop getting sick. This can be really helpful if you've got like debilitating nausea every time you travel. And so it's not like your body actually needs to get anything toxic out. You just need something to communicate to your stomach. Stop getting sick. And if you don't want to, you know, take these different drugs with all these different side effects, then you should try Relief Band. My sister-in-law has used Relief Band for motion sickness, and it really worked well for her. Go to reliefband.com. You'll receive 20% off plus free shipping, R-E-L-I-E-F-B-A-N-D.com slash Ally and use promo code Ally for 20% off plus free shipping. Reliefband.com slash Ally, reliefband.com slash Ally. Different question. Now, this is something that we talk about a lot. So I don't know if you're asking because maybe you don't listen to the show very often, or maybe you're asking a deeper question that you feel like we haven't really touched on when we talk about gender ideology. And the question is, why are people for the normalization of kids having the option to choose their gender? So I think that's actually a good question and maybe one that we don't touch on that much because we talk about how insane it is. We talk about the biblical reasons why male and female exist, the biological reasons why that sex dichotomy and gender dichotomy of male and female exist. So, but the question would be, why are people for the normalization of kids having the option to choose their gender, knowing everything that we know about the dangers of puberty blockers, the dangers of cross-sex hormones, the dangers of these surgeries, which are being performed on minors, teenagers, but puberty blockers on much younger than teenagers because it has to be pre-puberty to work. So why in the world would anyone be for that? So I think the vast majority of people who say that they're for the normalization of kids so-called transitioning, they have not thought about it. This is true of most people also who say that they're pro-choice. They haven't thought about it. Beyond the talking points, beyond being constantly inundated by the ubiquitous progressive culture, the progressive zeitgeist, they just haven't thought about it. Like if you ask someone, why are you pro-choice? They might say, well, I believe in a woman's right to choose. I believe in women's liberation. I believe in bodily autonomy. I believe, it, you know, what about those terrible circumstances in which a woman gets pregnant? She was coerced into having sex, all of these different things. But if you get down to it and you ask them, why do you believe it's okay to purposely kill some humans and not others? Because there's really no debate if you're talking to a sane person about whether the child inside the womb is human, they might not think it's valuable, but it's human at the point of conception. It can't be anything else. Can't put it in any other category in the universe. So why do you believe it is okay? It should be legal to kill some humans. Is it just because they're defenseless? Just because they're small? Just because it's early on in development? So you ask all these questions and they typically don't have an answer. They haven't thought about it. They'll divert you. They'll use red herrings. They'll say, yeah, but what about this? Which has nothing to do with what you're actually asking them. That's what it comes down to. Why do you believe it's okay to kill some humans? some innocent humans and not others. They haven't thought through it because it's really difficult. It's really difficult even for like the most ardent pro-choice person to say, yes, I believe that killing defenseless human beings is okay if that's what someone wants to do. I mean, that's what underlies the abortion argument. And then also when you go to gender, like why do you believe that it's okay? You believe that most of these people who are for this transition, they would say, that kids, rightly, they would say that kids can't consent to sex because their brain hasn't fully developed to be able to do that. And it's wrong to prey upon children in a sexual way. They would say, you know, an 11 year old doesn't have the physical or mental ability to be able to drive. They shouldn't be able to be able to make major life decisions. A lot of people, not everyone, but a lot of people on the left would agree that maybe an 11 year old 
um, can't vote. They just don't have the cognitive ability to be able to do that. They don't have the emotional capacity to make major decisions. They shouldn't be able to get married at 12 years old. And yet they will say, well, they should be able to make the life altering decision to pause their puberty, which is not temporary, but does have long term, often lifelong repercussions such as sterility. And when you ask them these questions, they typically will just be angry. And again, they'll revert to these euphemisms. Well, I don't want to be transphobic. I don't want to be bigoted. At the end of the day, most people have not thought through their positions. They're not even really for the things that they say that they're for. And because like we on the other side of these things are so against the zeitgeist, like we're you know, we always talk about being human salmon, like we're swimming upstream, like we have to really understand both our argument and the other side's argument. That's why we typically are so much more effective in debate than the other side. And so often when you're talking to your friends and your family who are on the other side of these issues, they just erupt in anger and they start calling you names. Yeah, because they're in, they're, they're insecure. They're actually not armed with any logical defenses for why they believe what they believe. And they just are like, I don't want to debate. I don't want to debate. Um, but they will still insist upon calling you a bigot. And they'll call you divisive for actually having an answer for the things that you believe and they'll call themselves empathetic. That's what it comes down to. They think that they're empathetic. Now, of course, there are other reasons beyond that. I think that's the vast majority of people really on the left in general, whether it comes to any issue. But then there's, of course, the people, as we've talked about, who are perverse, who have a perverse incentive to trap children in perpetual adolescence. Think about that. That's what puberty blockers do, Um, who have a perverse incentive to make men into women. Um, We've talked about the pervasiveness of something called, it's very disturbing, just FYI, go back and listen to my episodes with Genevieve Gluck, we'll link some of them, Um, but uh, sissy porn, kind of pornography that actually glorifies humiliation of men and makes them dress up like little girls, that has become a very popular fetish among these men who now claim to be women. And so there's that. And then there's also big, um, uh, big medicine, I guess you would call it the industrial medical complex that makes a lot of money from puberty blockers. I mean, they're creating lifelong patients because these women who are put on testosterone, well, they're going to have lifelong health problems. These men who are put on estrogen, lifelong health problems, especially when they decide one day when their brain is developed and they're 27 years old, oh, yeah, maybe I actually do want a child. Well, you can't do that naturally because your body has been mutilated and your hormones are all jacked up. And so now you have to pay more money to big fertility the uh, uh, medical industrial complex. And so there's also a money incentive there. There's ideology incentive, there's sexual incentive, and um, there's control incentive too. That's why a lot of this propaganda is actually being pushed by the Chinese Communist Party. Um, Okay, Uh, next question. Why don't you talk more about the Second Amendment? So the Second Amendment, I obviously really care about it and I really believe in it and I think attacks on it are wrong. It's just, I, I don't really know. Like I don't have... A good answer for that. There are just issues that I think that I am um, more well versed on, better versed on um, than the Second Amendment and gun laws. I think it's really important um, in opposition to tyranny. And I think that you should defend yourself. And I think that you should take advantage of Second Amendment protections. And I think a lot of the arguments, not all, not all, but a lot of the arguments, um, in the wake of tragedies of school shootings um, in favor of, you know, gun laws are just bad faith. Not all of them are bad faith, but a lot of them are. And they're just kind of illogical and disconnected from the reality of what laws actually do and what the Second Amendment is, too. I also think it's just used as a diversion tactic on the left that, oh, you can't say that you care about anything unless you are for confiscating people's guns. And I think that's silly. But, yeah, I just don't talk about it as much because I think that I am. Um, I think I'm more interested in and just better at talking about some of these other issues. Okay, guys, let me tell y'all about crowd health. If you are looking for a better way to cover your healthcare expenses and you want to get out of the complicated mess of health insurance, then you should look into crowd health. It's not health insurance. 
CrowdHealth gives you the tools to negotiate and crowdfund your medical bills. All you have to do is pay $50 a month. That's your membership fee get, to get access to services like telemedicine, to bill negotiation. And then you join the crowd, of course, which is a group of members just like you who want to help pay for each other's unexpected medical events. The thing about health insurance, guys, is that it feels like you don't have insurance even when you have it. I mean, premiums are increasing, deductibles are getting larger, claims denials are becoming more common, things get so complicated and messy with things like doctors' networks. You don't have to worry about any of that when it comes to crowd health. It's not insurance. It is a better and a simpler way to cover your unexpected health care expenses. And you join a community of people that are in the same boat as you that want to help each other out and you just have to pay that $50 membership fee. So simplify your life, give yourself peace of mind by joining Crowd Health. Opt out of restrictive health insurance plans and let Crowd Health help fit your health care needs. Get started for just $50 a month. Use code ALLY to get the health care you deserve. Crowd Health is not insurance. Learn more at joincrowdhealth.com. That's joincrowdhealth.com, code ALLY. <music> Okay, this is a very, very, very serious question. A would you rather? Um, would you rather have hot dogs for fingers or spaghetti hair? Um, definitely spaghetti hair. Definitely spaghetti hair. If it's like regular hair and that it grows back, okay. I mean, you're gonna lose a little bit of hair every day. Spaghetti's not that strong. But think about having hot dogs for fingers. You can't you don't, you're missing a joint. Like you can't bend your fingers. You can't do anything. You can't write. You can't type. Um, it would be completely useless to have hot dogs. I would rather not have fingers than have hot dogs for fingers. But yeah, yeah. So I'm going to go with spaghetti hair for that one. Um, that would, I mean, that would really change my life though. I don't know how many people would be watching on YouTube if I had spaghetti hair. Um, let's see. Uh... Am I optimistic or pessimistic for the future of our country? So I was just speaking at an event where the um, where the host of the event, the head of the organization, distinguished between optimism and hope. And I I think I don't I'm not you know I I I don't have a problem with people using the word optimism, but I do think that there is a difference. And I think that it comes from a place of faith, like optimism, I would see, okay, you're looking at indications of what the future is going to hold. And if it's positive, then you're optimistic about it. Or you're looking at indications or what you think are indications of what the future may hold and you think they're all bad or negative. And so you are pessimistic about the future, whereas hope, I think is rooted in something a lot deeper, no matter what the indications are of where the future of the country is going, which I would say the indications are bad, just based on the moral collapse of our country, the stupidity that is now glorified, the Romans one that is manifesting every day, the political corruption that we have, and how little it seems like we can really do about it. Yeah, like, okay, there's a lot of negative indications there. Not that there's no positive indications, but there are some negative indications about where the future of the country is going. So I don't know that I can say that I'm optimistic, but I can say that I'm hopeful. Because when I look throughout history at change. I know that it didn't happen a day. When I look at something like Roe v. Wade being overturned after 49 years of relentless perseverance of unsung and unseen pro-life heroes just pushing for truth in every sphere of culture, private and public, I think, okay, things can change. Just because things seem bleak right now doesn't mean that at least one thing can't change for the better. Maybe not everything all at once, but maybe one of these things. Maybe it's gender ideology and the transitioning of children. Maybe that changes. Maybe it takes 20 years, but it's going to take us raising a relentless and respectful ruckus every single day in a million different ways in our lives to do that. And so when I see the perseverance of people, when I see the courage of people that are willing to count the cost for the sake of the most vulnerable in this country, which is what makes America unique, then I think, okay, I'm hopeful because I can look back on history and see that things have changed for the better. But I'm also hopeful because it's rooted in like a, 
it's rooted in my faith in Christ, is that no matter where the country goes, even if it really does go completely to hell in a handbasket and God just takes his hand off completely and like no amount of evil is held back and he has no patience and, and no mercy anymore, which we completely, I think, deserve as a country. Even if that happens, I know who wins in the end. And my task as a Christian doesn't change. My calling to not be anxious does not change. My command that God has given me to not fear, to not worry, to rejoice in everything, to think about what is lovely and pure and excellent, that doesn't change. My call to share the gospel, to raise my kids, to do the next right thing in faith with excellence and for the glory of God does not change. And so that is what I can take comfort in. I am hopeful that if enough people do that, maybe things can change for the better. But if not, I know that God is still going to be glorified. Romans 8, 28, he works all things together for the good of those who love him. He's working all things together for his glory and our good. That is what I can trust in. That is where my hope lies. And I try to change things for the better with the grounding of that hope, not based on some flimsy optimism or pessimism. Um, let's see, just a couple more questions. Um, who's my favorite superhero? Don't have one. Don't like superhero movies. Uh, if you're talking about like Marvel, I don't, what's the difference between Marvel and what's the other one? DC. What? I don't even know. What's the difference between that and Star Wars? I have no idea. I really don't. (laughs) I'm not hating on it. If you like that kind of stuff, I know a lot of people do. Um, but um, one time I was on Ben Shapiro Sunday special. And when we were taking a break before the end of it, I was like, I got him to instead talk about theology. He was about to ask me about Marvel and DC. And I was like, no, 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 Ben, we're not talking about that. <laughs> Let's talk about something else that I know a little bit about. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't, I'm Wonder Woman. Sure. Not Spider-Man. Too skinny. Um, (laughs) I I don't know, Batman, Superman, sure, any of those. Is Catwoman a superhero or is she a villain? I have no idea. Um, The Incredibles, yeah, I might call them Harry Potter. Is that a superhero? (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) My producer Brie is laughing at me behind the camera. Um... Thoughts on the future of Christian higher ed? I'm actually hopeful. I'm actually hopeful in this. Like, I think that there are positive developments that Christians are like, yeah, don't like the public school system, but we're going to build something better. Um, I see that happening, or at least non-progressive entities. I mean, we see that happening in Florida. I see these kinds of colleges like cropping up around the country and charter schools and things like that started by Christians. Um, I'm, I'm actually very positive about that. I think a lot of people are going to, you know, just homeschool or not go to college and that's fine. But I also think it's awesome to build new institutions. Like, okay, maybe that's one of the reasons why I am not completely pessimistic. Yes. Hope, optimism, all that. But Christians have been in the business of building culture and building institutions, hospitals, charities, colleges, all of these entities for hundreds of years. I mean, certainly the building of America and our first and greatest institutions were started by Christians. I mean, that's why the vast majority of hospitals and colleges, all of them have Christian origins. Like maybe being kind of pushed to the margins and not having this kind of privileged place in society anymore, Christians are forced to build excellent institutions. We do that really well. Let's lean into that. So I feel good about that. What is my go-to coffee order? Um, So I guess by the time this episode is coming out, I've already announced that I'm pregnant. So in pregnancy, I have not liked, so I typically, I would say black hot coffee. Honestly, saying that right now makes me want to throw up. I don't know why, but black hot coffee throughout this pregnancy, it was not like this in my first two pregnancies, but it just, I don't know. It just makes me want to gag. It's so weird, but that's what I would have had every morning And now, for some reason, during pregnancy, I just haven't been able to do it, but I've needed caffeine. First trimester, I didn't have caffeine. But um, so I will do iced coffee. I just make it at home, iced coffee, and then I put some vanilla almond milk in there, and then a little bit of vanilla extract, and then I have my little frother mixer, mix it together, 
put some ice in there. It's not going to taste like a Starbucks drink. It's not like super sweet, but that is what I have on any given morning. I have it, have it with me right now in my little taking care of babies cup. Okay, so we still have got some summer left. If you are in a place like I am where it's going to be hot for like the next six months, then you still have the opportunity to grill out. You might as well make sure that you are grilling out with American steaks and better than organic chicken from Good Ranchers. Don't you want to make sure that all of the meat that you're eating is super high quality, especially now that we're hearing talks about like injecting mRNA and all this fake stuff into our meat? Well, Good Ranchers ensures that none of that junk is in their meat. It's all actually from American farms and ranchers rather than just packaged in the USA and imported from overseas. They make sure that the whole process is in the United United States. Plus the people who run Good Ranchers, they're Christians, they're conservatives, they're pro-life. They've got the same values that you and I do. Plus the convenience factor. That's that's it for me. Like that's the uh, one of the big game changers here is getting my meat show up at my front door every month on dry ice rather than having to go to the grocery store and pick everything out and worry about rising costs. Like that just makes my life so much easier and to know that at least one part of our meal is is available and healthy every night. There's a lot of security too that comes from having a freezer full of really good meat. Uh, good Ranchers donates 10 meals for every box ordered to families in need. Though, so that's just another win. Go to GoodRanchers.com. Use code Allie at checkout for $30 off Good Ranchers. Uh, GoodRanchers.com. Use code Allie for $30 off GoodRanchers.com. Code Allie. All right. Uh, let's see. I think we have time for one... Or two more. Okay. Encouragement for Christian conservative public school teachers. So as I just said, a lot of Christians were they're building other institutions. A lot of Christians, understandably, and I would say that this is the right move, are pulling their kids out of Christians or out of public schools and putting them in uh, Christian schools and putting them in a homeschool, giving them homeschool curriculum. And if you want to go back and listen to my episodes on that, you can. We won't get into my whole argument about why we shouldn't be sending our Christian kids to public school. But Christian teachers, that's different because we're talking about adults. We're talking about probably a position that you feel like God has called you to and has equipped you to do. And now some of you, I completely understand, you're a Christian public school teacher and you're like, I am out. They're not even allowing me to say anything. They're forcing me to teach gender ideology and stuff. And so I, I don't want you to ever sin because you are placed in that position. But like, if you can be there, if you can be there, you feel like you're called to be there and God has equipped you to be there. Um, then I want you to shine as brightly as you possibly can, because look, you are the only representation of Christ that a lot of these kids will ever see. Like I still remember, I went to a a Christian school, kindergarten through 12th grade. So it's a little bit different, but I still have I have some bad teachers, some mean teachers too. I still remember the kind teachers that I had, the teachers that attended to me. And okay, again, Christian school, like I don't think these teachers that I'm thinking of necessarily like shared the gospel with me, although that's great, but they were kind and I still am affected by their kindness and how they attended to me maybe in different ways that teachers hadn't. I just like didn't really like school that much because I was constantly talking in class. And so there were different ways probably that I dealt with discipline. But like my fourth grade teacher had such an incredible impact on me because of her kindness, because of her joy, because of her love for her job, which I understand is rare in a public education setting because she had a great attitude because I could tell she really loved and liked her students that's a big game changer. Be different than all of your nagging, sad, depressed, don't want to work hard teachers. Like I have enough teacher friends that I understand that that is the environment in a lot of public schools that you're just like constantly complaining about how difficult it is, constantly complaining about how emotionally trying it is, how much money you don't make, not liking your kids. I'm not saying that you can't have those feelings because I think that they're valid in some ways for sure, but you can distinguish yourself by doing nothing um, with grumbling or arguing or having a bad attitude, but having a great attitude, getting up every day and loving and liking those kids, 
man, you can make such a difference. And you might not see the difference. Like you might feel like, well, my classroom is chaos every single day. I feel like these kids don't listen to me. They don't respect me. You have no idea how God is planting those seeds of kindness and love in those kids that might not take root and grow for another 20 to 25 years. You may never know about it. As I often say, we won't see like the constellation of our testimonies and other people's testimonies until we get to the other side, until eternity. And yet you have no idea what star you are in someone's constellation testimony. And we may never know because it's not for us to know. It's for God's glory to know. But I guarantee you as a Christian teacher, you play a part in every future Christian that walks into your door, a part of his or her testimony, as well as your administrators, as well as the other teachers um, that you're a part. So set yourself apart in your attitude, in your words, in your actions. And thank you for doing what you do, because I know that it's not easy. All right. Um, Okay, I think that's all we have time for today. Like I said, wide range. I have a ton of more questions that I could get to. Thank you so much for sending them in and we will see you back here soon. Hey guys, if you love this podcast, please leave us a five-star review wherever you listen on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. And if you haven't yet, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks. Thanks.